there's always somebody that's got it worse, but that's a lot of years to have robbed from you. The spirit that you guys display is astounding. You had somebody confess two days later and then ultimately confess again. And Marty, a week after the attacks on your parents, the business partner that your dad had, by the way, he owed your dad a half a million dollars, right? He, Jerry Struman owed my dad uh, over a half a million dollars. Uh, within days, he cleaned out a joint bank account, told his family he'd be swimming with the fish, faked his death, had five aliases, fled from New York to New Jersey to California, uh, and was found hiding in a psychiatric retreat, but he was never considered a suspect after all of that. So he owes him money. Within a week, he flees, disguises himself, uses an alias. One of five he had. And was never considered a suspect at the time. No. Even though he did all that, his son was a drug dealer who had enforcers. He was someone who had hired a biker gang to commit violent acts in the past. He was not considered a suspect for one single moment. Uh, I've known this for a long, long time. And every time I revisit the details of it, I've just, I'm just outraged. But you're not. I'm not because it's very interesting. So as I mentioned, I teach this class. And we recently had one of our students ask another exoneree, you know, do you ever regret or ever think about what your life would be like had you not gone to prison? And it was a moment that really started me thinking about the impact I've had in the last 10, 12, 13 years that I've been free. I mean, I've been part of this class at Georgetown where I've walked three people out of prison. I've got two former students who are working the Innocence Project, paying it forward. I've got countless other former students who are going on to law school looking to make a difference. I think about all those people's lives that I've touched, and had I not gone to prison, where would they be? Am I angry? Am I bitter? Yes, but it's at the individuals that put me there. But... As one of my lawyers said, he said, Marty, he goes, think about this. You're 10 years free. Tom Spoda, who was the senior prosecutor who fought to keep me in prison, is in prison today himself. The chief of police that was in charge of the investigation during the, the, the reinvestigation, he himself went to prison. McCready is deceased. Two of the murderers, Peter Kent and Joseph Creedon, are deceased. The lives of so many of the people that destroyed my life are either in living hell, they're dead, or they're in prison. As one lawyer said to me, he goes, where are you, Marty? You're free, you're a professor, you're a lawyer, and you're making a difference in people's lives. Never forget that. What would you be doing, Marty, if this hadn't happened to you when you were 17? Where do you think life would have taken you? Uh, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I was very much into business when I was young. I had a sports memorabilia business with my dad. I had some connections to some very well-known business people back then. But it wouldn't have been what I'm doing today. Uh, you know, today, for, I mean, t- tomorrow night is, you know, May is the final day of my fifth year of teaching a class at Georgetown. With my childhood friend, Mark Howard, that I've known since I was three years old when we went to Lovey Dovey Preschool. And this, was a, this, this Mark is a man who was a tenured professor of government who got back in my life, decided to change his complete career at Georgetown, went on to law school. And in 2018, he asked if I would teach a class together, and we did. And, you know, it was four months later, Valentino Dixon walked out of prison. That's amazing. Let's put a bow around that because what actually got this moving, these students at Georgetown were your students, right, Marty? They were, but just one little back note is that when I was in law school, 
that's the first time I became aware of Valentino Dixon's case. And I was working in a law firm that was trying to free him, and we couldn't do it, but I made a commitment to Valentino that there would come a day sometime in the future that I would be able to help him. And in 2018, it was that day. And when I called him up, it was probably one of the most exciting days for him and his family. And we had three young students. We had Julie, Ellie, and Noya, who reinvestigated the case, did an amazing job. Um, And we can go into some details about what they did because they are three little rock stars. Well, they produced this powerful documentary and broke new ground not only by interviewing former witnesses, but also by filming the original prosecutor who revealed information critical to Valentino's final appeal. And their interview of the new district attorney, John Flynn, ended with a promise by him to conduct a thorough and fair review of the case as part of his new CIU, the Conviction Integrity Unit. And I assume he made good on that. So these students, just fueled by passion, were a big factor in getting this thing broken free, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, their, their passion and their dedication, I think Valentino can can speak to that as somebody who benefited from their passion. But, uh, you know, I remember very early on where... You know, everybody kind of said, oh, this is a crazy idea that Mark and Marty are teaching this class. They're getting these, you know, undergraduate students to reinvestigate it. And I think, you know, these undergraduate students that went up to see the original prosecutor, I think they were more prepared and more knowledgeable about the case than he was. And I think he felt that, you know, oh, they're just these two young women who are going to interview me, that they don't know enough about the case. And until all of a sudden you see them kind of, you know, barrage him with questions nonstop. And he revealed something that we hadn't known for 25 years. And what was that? That there were uh, gunshot residue tests done on Valentino that had come back negative. And that's the first time that we had actually known about that, which essentially is a, is a violation of the law because the government is obligated to turn over any evidence that is favorable to the accused. And clearly, evidence that showed Valentino didn't shoot a gun is favorable to him, which was never disclosed. So the prosecution had that evidence. Yes. Exculpatory evidence, and they did not produce that. Nope. Wow. And, and I, I kind of remember the day when the students were in this prison and, and everything is filmed, and they come out of the prison and... They all kind of look at each other, and I wasn't there, and Mark wasn't there, and they all look at each other, and they kind of went, did that just happen? And they called us up, and we talked about it, and I don't know how quickly we let Valentina know about it, but we let Valentina's lawyers know about it, and that was a huge part of the application that was submitted to John Flynn uh, to secure Jan- uh, Valentina's freedom. Wow. Now, Valentino, you say you got these colored pencils, you started doing drawings, and you started drawing scenes of golf courses. Why did you make your first golf course drawing? (laughs) Dr. Phil, let me say something to you, right? Now, I'm a black kid from the inner city. I never golfed before. I don't know nothing about the sport. You know, it's foreign to me. And the warden who knew me personally said, Valentino, could you draw my favorite golf hole? I said, come on, Ward, I never golf. We both laughed. He brought a picture in. I drew a 12th hole of Augusta. That's it right there on the screen. Right. We're looking at it. Yes, he loved it. And it's over with. It's done. Okay. He retired a couple months later. My neighbor said, hey, Valentino, you should draw more golf scenes. I said, hell no, I'm not drawing no more golf scenes. And he tossed two Golf Digest magazines on my bunk. And he says, hey, man, you know, I think there's something you should take an interest in. Well, I don't know why I did. I start looking through the magazines, the Golf Digest magazines, and I started falling in love with the golf courses. And I started drawing them every day. Fast forward six months later, I had about 40 drawings. And I sent one of them to the Golf Digest magazine with a letter explaining what happened to me. They couldn't believe it. 
and they investigated and they wrote a story on me. Max Aller uh, wrote a story in July 2012. And I never stopped drawing golf courses after that. And then the golf channel got involved and then national media, you know, and then Marty came and saved the day. But, but Dr. Phil, just so you know, it was that Valentino drawing a golf course, which piqued the interest of the lawyer where I was working at that time to take on Valentino's case because he loved golf. And it was, that was how I got connected to Valentino. You know, so it really is if Valentino had not decided or had the superintendent not asked him to draw a golf course, Valentino and I never would have met. Yeah, that's true. Wow, that's just amazing. I'm looking at this first one that you drew for the warden mm-hmm. from Augusta. I've played that hole, and that's a that's a damn good rendition of it, I can tell you. Thank you. Except you can't see all of my balls in the water <laughs> where I hit them. And it says, Michelle Obama gifted this drawing to Barack for Christmas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did she come by it? She saw me on HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbo and reached out, you know. And people, you know, they love the drawings, and most people think they're paintings. They say, oh, those are nice paintings. They're all pencil, color pencil. I mean, I spent 80 hours on some of these drawings. Wow. Yeah, and, and you know, even John McEnroe reached out, you know, the great tennis legend, and got two of them. So, I mean, if God don't bless me with anything else left in his life, I'm I'm okay with it. <laughs> Yeah, I see one here, Tiger. Yep, I met Tiger at the Masters. I told Tiger he was going to win in 2019, and and he won. So you actually have been to Augusta? Oh, yeah. I live in Augusta right now. I'm from Buffalo, and I live in Augusta. (laughs) So you live there now? I live here. I moved down here uh, 10 months ago, so I live in Augusta. And how do you like it? I love it. It's it's, You know, it's peaceful and quiet for me, and and I love the weather. I mean, I, I've never had it this peaceful, man. I, you know, I, like I grew up in a rough part of Buffalo and then I went to prison at 21. So you can, you know, I mean, imagine that I never had no real peace until now. 